Today on the Inner Circle podcast, my guest is Dr. Terry Schroeder of Live in Alignment Chiropractic, and you can find him at liveinalignment.org. We talk about all things health, wellness, chiropractic, new biohacks, leadership, coaching, and why having a mentor and a coach really matters in your life and your success as a filmmaker. Welcome to the Inner Circle Podcast. Dr. Terry, I'm so excited to have you here. I'm excited to be here too. Uh, well, thank you so much for making <clears throat> the time to come and talk to us. And I think the first question that I would love to hear from you is, you know, you are an Olympic champion, you are a chiropractor, you are a dad, you're a husband, you're a coach, you're a mentor, you have so many things <laughs> that you're juggling. Yeah. And what is really important to you at this phase of your life? That's a great question. Um, you know, th I think that um, one of the most important things to me right now is to continue to figure out balance. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, when I was coaching our US Olympic team, I did that for seven years, and when I was done with that in 2012, my health was kind of in trouble. I was pre-diabetic, I was 30 pounds overweight, you know, high body fat, blood pressure was up, wasn't sleeping very good. Uh, so at that point, uh, my wife and I, who's Dr. Lori Schroeder, also a chiropractor, uh, we decided that we were going to change the name and kind of change the direction of our practice, and we changed the name to Live in Alignment. And living alignment obviously has a lot of implications for the chiropractic world, but mm. to me, it's really about the balance that mm -hmm. we can try to find and try to seek. And that's always been a big challenge because <clears throat> I think as an Olympian, especially, you get very single-minded, single-focused. Yes. And there's not a lot of room for everything else. And um, we were talking that, about that a little bit earlier about how so many men especially, but it also happens with females, they become very successful in what they do, but they oftentimes forget about some of the most important things in life. And that's, I think, health and relationships. Um, you know, of course, health includes exercise and diet and sleeping right and all these good things. So what's really important to me is is figuring out that balance of have enough time to play and enjoy my family and do special things with Lori and my kids still. Um, but to continue to learn and grow as a chiropractor and a, mm. a functional medicine practitioner and a coach, um, to keep learning, keep growing and, and not get stagnant. Um, and that is so important. And as a part of that, I know that you are incredibly disciplined. Yeah. I mean, you, you have, you know, your bust at the Coliseum, <laughs> all these things that yeah. you've accomplished. And you're honestly one of the most accomplished people mm. that I know. And filmmakers have a very similar problem to yourself in terms of like that singular focus, right. especially if you're on a feature film. Right. And it's very easy easy to get out of balance and to become, you know, really great at one thing and kind of forget about all the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. So with your morning routine and, and with your commitment to fitness and balance, how do you do it? Like what, what tricks yeah. do you have for everybody? So if I don't get up early in the morning and get my exercise in, I don't get it done because I know that my day will get away from me. Mm -hmm. So I've become pretty disciplined. I've always been an early riser. So I get up early, and usually it's still dark. Um, get on, uh, we have an elliptical machine at home. I'll do some cardio. Um, I, lo I love my little mini trampoline. I usually jump on that for 15 or 20 minutes you know, each morning. Uh, I'll do some core work. Um, and I'll do a lot of pulling type exercises. I mean, as a chiropractor, I'm pushing on people all day long. So again, it comes back to that balance. You know, okay. what can I do to keep my body balanced? So I'm doing a lot of rowing, a lot of pulls. I, I generally tell people because it's the same in this world of computers and postures. People get overbalanced. They get too strong here. So most people need to build up their backs a little bit more. 
and do more pulling type exercises. But I'll spend anywhere between 30 and 45 minutes, you know, most mornings doing some exercise. Um, unfortunately, I've kind of become allergic to chlorine. So oh, no I way. don't get in the pool as much as I, I like to. I love to swim in the ocean still, but I don't um, have access to that as much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I try to get my morning exercise in. I think another thing that's really important um, in today's world is to get exposure to the sun, to get outside more. Yes. Um, we live in this world where we're stuck inside so much and we're disconnected with nature, we're disconnected with the sun. I think so many people get out of balance with their circadian rhythms. And mm. if you can get out in the morning for 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes before 10 a.m., you're getting the infrared light that really sets your body up to get on those circadian rhythms properly where you're going to be awake during the day and be asleep during the night. Yeah. I know that's probably hard for some filmmakers who have crazy hours and are going, 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 but um, you can ride out the storm, but you want to get back to your routine as much as you can when, when you have the time to do that. So, right. And so if you, <clears throat> that's really important. And I think sometimes the simplest things, it's a simple thing. For we, sure. we forget about, you know, yeah. we try to overcomplicate. <clears throat> so it's, Maybe getting up 20 minutes or 30 minutes early, trying to get that exercise in at whatever time of day that looks like. Yeah. And then really, if you can get any sunlight at all, um, try to get that. What about mindset and mental? Because I think of health in terms of physical, mental, emotional, yeah. spiritual. For sure. And, you know, kind of the whole integrative part. So what? how do you I, – I know that mindset is a huge part of your – yeah. you know, it has to be with the Olympics and, and training and as an athlete. Yeah. But how does that also play into, you know, chiropractic and, and kind of what you're trying to give your patients as their physician? Yeah, it's a good question. When I go outside and get my morning light, I also look at that as my quiet time. Mm -hmm. my downtime and and maybe I'm watering a little bit or but I'm trying to get my eyes in the sun early on but I'm also trying to um, get my mind in the right place um, and by that I mean that um, I want to uh, think young myself you mm -hmm. know I, I'm when I get up in the morning I try not to say oh you know I'm hurting I'm hurting. sore <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, we were at a uh, longevity conference this weekend, and the guy, he's going to be 70 next week. He says, I get up every morning, I, th I say to myself, I'm 27. What am I going to do today? Now, I haven't done that, but I, I definitely think positive thoughts. I think about mm -hmm. gratitude. I think gratitude is so important to get your mind in the right place. Um, and just to spend that 15 or 20 minutes outside is quiet time, because once the day starts, there's not a lot of quiet time. Um, you know, yes. I may pray a little bit, um, just meditate on what the day looks like. Um, but that's kind of balance that out with getting my eyes in the sunshine early on, but also using that as my quiet time to get my mind in the right place for the day. That's so great. And so when, and I think again, similar to being on set, everything is coming at you yeah. in terms of decision making and people asking things of you and issues yeah. happening. And so it happens in your day, but your day may be extended because you're also coaching potentially yeah. at Pepperdine or you, when you were doing the Olympics, all of that training. And so how did you have the mental grit or the the wherewithal, because, you know, I, it's funny, I think one of the things that I notice about myself is that I really do need some quiet downtime in yeah. my day because of the mental stress, yeah. being a business owner and, and a leader and all of those things. And I feel like mental stress only increases with age. And that can be the one stressor that really impacts people and they don't even realize it. Right. And then it impacts your body, Right. right. For sure. Um, one of the things I've learned from my days of being an athlete is that the last play doesn't really matter. It's the next play that you always want to focus on. And if I was to let what happened throughout the day continue to weigh in my shoulders, by the end of the day, I'd be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And I've had players like that, you know, as a coach, you see players like that, that, you know, they get a couple of bad calls against them or they make a bad pass or a bad shot. And as things start to go bad, it just kind of piles up over and over and over again. But um, this mindset of focusing on the next play, the next, you know, scene, whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, and not, I, I, I've learned not to carry that baggage with me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty good at filtering things out and saying that I can't control that. It's out of my control and I'm going to let that go. Um, and, you know, part of that is surrounding yourself with good people that can take care of some of that other stuff that maybe is stuff that will weigh you down. And, yes. you know, the little things that come up that somebody else can take care of that I don't have to, which helps me tremendously. I mean, we have a great team at the office. I've got great coaches I work with. So it's not all on me. You know. And and that's so important. Yeah. And I think that we tend, or especially if you're perfectionistic, it's yeah. very hard to delegate. Yeah. And I see that, you know, and it's hard to let go of things. And I don't know if you noticed that at a point in your life where maybe you were hanging on to something and it really becomes residue that impacts your future. And I think that this is where it's so tricky. I do the same thing where it's yeah. like, do I have control over it or not? Yeah. And if I don't, yeah. I, I can't let that impact me because then you then you become a version of yourself that you really don't like very much. Yeah. And you become more impatient and more negative. Right. And, and we see this and then that becomes poisonous to the environment For that sure. you're in because then you're the grumbly human that people don't really want to be around right, right? Yeah. yeah and for sure you know what i do as a coach and what i do as a chiropractor um it's that same idea it's the next play if i walk into a room and the last patient you know really took it out of me it's gonna play on this person too right where they're gonna say what's wrong with you you know <laughs> i don't think i want to want you to adjust me today i don't want you to work on me so when I walk into a new room, it's a new play. It's a brand new opportunity for me to be at my best. And, um, you know, one of our daughters, Leanna, is an artist. And she is such, uh, she was such a perfectionist that, you know, it would be so difficult for her to finish an art piece because yeah. everything she did, she had to get it just, just right. And I want to be the best. You know, that's part of that Olympic spirit. I want to always work to be my best but i do realize that there's nobody that's perfect <laughs> yeah and i'm gonna still have bad moments throughout the day mm -hmm. um but i gotta focus on the good moments um yeah, i read a really good book not too long ago it was called chasing daylight and it was about a guy who a very successful um, businessman who found out he had cancer and he only had so long to live and he used this idea of chasing daylight as trying to get the most out every day Mm -hmm. And one of the main focal points in that book was finding perfect moments during the day that you can grab onto and say, that was awesome. You know, that was a great moment. And, and the more you can find those perfect moments, and they don't have to be like huge things. Right. They can be little wins throughout the day that just, you know, little special times with your spouse, your wife, with your kids. Um, it, it's been a really good exercise for me to do that. Because I love that. And yeah. that way your brain is also selectively sorting for the positive. Yeah. And so you're setting it up yeah. to be its best, right? Like I, I really do a lot of gratitude or try to find, it, it, this is one little habit that I have that in emails when I'm paying invoices or bills, I always try to write something that the person did so well or how they helped right. the business yeah. instead of just like, okay to pay, right? Right, right. <laughs> and, yeah. and I think those little practices add up yeah. to such a great um thing in the end because it br you're brightening somebody's day you're yeah. you're finding something to make a difference on right For sure absolutely and and coaching you know, there's a guy named john wooden who is a really famous basketball coach at ucla and he always said that he tried to say seven positive things before he made a critique mm -hmm. that's really hard to do in coaching <laughs> because sometimes <laughs> what goes on like blows your mind you feel like you have to like react but um, it is really true what you said. If you can focus on some of the positive things that somebody's doing and, and really 
build that into your reply or to your critique, it makes such a big difference in how they take it to and how they learn from it. It's huge. Yeah. It's huge. So I'd love to circle back to um, when you got out of balance and just talk about balance a little bit more Mm -hmm. because I feel that balance is... Everybody said, at least for women, I feel especially that we're set up yeah. where there's this expectation that you should be able to juggle it all and and have a career and maintain right. the home and family life and for men, too. And that, you know, um, everything is perfectly balanced. Yeah. And what I know to be true is that is so false. Yeah. And that when you're focusing your effort on one area, other pieces in your life are going to suffer. Right. And so um, what Shane and I try to do, and it's really hard because like he's on a movie right now and Mm -hmm. we're so grateful for the work, but the lion's share of everything else then falls on me. And so it's like, how do you juggle that for six months? And I'm sure with you, with the Olympic, um, all of your different Olympic, you know, successes with your silver medals and yeah. with the coaching and everything, how that was a lot for Lori, um, your spouse. And it's like, how do you, how are you happy in a relationship? And how are you juggling all of these demands? Because you're a person, I think that you have to swim or you, yeah. you need to get that competitive because it's, it's your soul. It's who you are. Yeah. Right. You if you just had to be a chiropractor for the rest of your life, not that that's bad, but that would not be as fulfilling to you as a human. Yeah. Is what I'm trying to get at, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, it does. I mean, and, and that, you know, that perfect balance is impossible. Like you yeah. said, it's it's a fallacy. <laughs> it doesn't happen. And as you go through each day, there's different things that maybe are more important that day. But I think it's a constant um you know, I think as humans, we love scoreboards. We love to kind of know where we stand in a game, whether we look at it a game or not. But um, so where where are we at in the scoreboard? You know, yeah. are we missing here? Are we missing there? Are we good on this area? So there's a constant juggling of trying to bring things back into balance. And for sure, I get out of balance still from time to time. And mm-hmm. um, it's just a matter of um, pulling things back into the best I can. Right. Um, and that, that's a, a good lesson that my dad taught me early on. He said, you can't compare yourself to others. You got to just be the best that you can possibly be. And, and that you got to be happy with that. You know, if you can right. come back to that and know that you did your best, um, you know, honestly, being an athlete and, and competing in the Olympics was much easier than being an Olympic coach because the <laughs> Olympic coach was now spending all the same hours at the pool with the guys, but then going away and having to watch film on the opponent and having to prepare for workouts the next day and have, you know, all this other time commitment. So yeah, I was crazy. I mean, I was having dinner at 10 at night by myself and, you know, not getting exercise and just really things were way out of balance. And, and there was no way really, you know, with the Olympics, whatever, six months away to, mm-hmm try to pull things back into balance at that time. But I I knew that if I could kind of survive that storm and do the best I could to make time for Lori, make time for my family when I did have the downtime. Mm -hmm. Uh, And what we did is when we traveled on some of these trips, the girls oftentimes would come at the end of the trip and we'd make a little vacation out after the trip. We'd go somewhere for a week or something. So we figured out ways to make it work, but it wasn't perfect. It was, you know... It pretty, was messy in the middle. It's pretty messy yeah. in the middle. And <laughs> and like I said, my health really suffered for a while. Yeah. Because I, I was trying to keep everything else in balance and I realized that I, I could pull my health back into order once I was done with that chapter of my life. And I think that filmmakers will really relate to that. And I love your vulnerability about that because I think that so many times people look perfect from the outside. And then, you know, unless you're living in their home, you have no idea what, what is really happening or what their routines are. Right. They just, it's, it's the shiny image. And part of what, I, I respect the most about you is that you're so vulnerable mm-hmm. and so forthright about what life is really like mm-hmm. for you and not just, okay, here's the image of Dr. Yeah. Terry Schroeder. So yeah. I think um, filmmakers can relate to the crazy hours, 
eating. Shane right now, for example, is working, you know, splits. So uh, he may get done at one in the morning yeah. or two in the morning, and then you've got to do your wind down, and then you're sleeping until let's say eleven, right. and your clock is completely upside down. You don't have a lot of turnaround. He's doing six day weeks, yeah. so uh, there's barely a day off every other week, and I think that that is a similar. But different. I mean, yeah. it's a different, but it's similar yeah, to yeah, to sure. what you went through with the Olympics, yeah. where it, there's a relentlessness yeah. in in what is required for a specific time. Yeah. And it's such a gift and an opportunity that very few people have. Yeah. So you never want to complain about it. But at the same time, I think there's a recovery that's necessary at the end. Yeah. And having things to look forward to are so critical critically important because everybody feels like, oh my gosh, this amazing project or this amazing yeah. opportunity, you've got to chase it. Right. But then I agree on the trips at the end to have everybody have something right. to, to say, okay, this is awesome. Yeah. But then how do you recalibrate? Because the minute that the Olympics were finished, you're going right back to your day job yeah. as a chiropractor. <laughs> so it's like you're really doing two and three, if you count it yeah. as a dad, full-time jobs. Yeah, it's, you know, I love what I do. And I think that's a big part of it. Um, first got out of chiropractic school, I got asked if I would be willing to coach the Pepperdine water polo team. And I knew the president, Dr. Howard White, really well. And we had some conversations and said, look, I, I've been focused on getting my license and this is what I want to do. Yeah. So maybe I'll coach for a year or two while I get that going. Well, here we are 36 <laughs> years later. <laughs> and the honest truth is I fell in love with coaching and I fell in love with the opportunity to work with college age athletes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's such a special time in their lives and as I said, I, I surround myself with some really good people. So I've got two other really good coaches that handle a lot of the paperwork and a lot of the, the stuff details. that I just don't have time to do. But I get to be there with these guys. And, you know, I look at it as not only an opportunity, but a responsibility to mm -hmm. help mentor them. And, um, you know, sure, we want to do well. We want to win games. But more importantly, we want to try to teach these guys to be good men you know, to be better fathers and to be better dads, uh, better husbands, better dads, and uh, and to be successful in what they do outside of water polo too. So um, I, I love what I do. I, I love the opportunity to work with these guys. And sure, it's crazy at times. And, and it's kind of the same thing. You know, our season is short. We have a three-month season. So I'm not like running at that pace year round. Yes. I kind of prepare for it in a way. <laughs> and I think a really big word that I've learned over the last, I don't know, maybe 20 years. I mean, I probably knew it before that, but I didn't really focus on it as resiliency. Mm -hmm. And that's the ability to um, sometimes take that unexpected hit and still be able to have enough in the reserve to bounce back and, and you know, get back in the game, whether it's coaching or get back in the practice on a Monday morning and say, all right, we're, we're back in the game, <laughs> we're back in the saddle. Um, and I think when you love what you do, it, it becomes kind of easy to go to work and to do it day after day. Um, because it doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like work. It really yeah. doesn't. I mean, um, there's a very physical part of chiropractic of being, you know, and I have a lot of friends in the practice that um, have hurt their shoulders, hurt their backs, hurt their necks, and no longer practice. Um, so, you know, we're, what I'm really excited about in our practice is that we're reinventing ourselves in a way mm. to um, go more into the functional medicine world, more into what can we do to help people's brains be more balanced. And, um, you know, even beyond that, to live longer, healthier lives, you know, with something like we talked about a little bit, the, the yeah. whole stem cell idea of, um, you know, what are the possibilities of, uh, not only living longer, but living longer better. You know? Exactly. And yeah. I want to get into that. Before yeah. we do, I think we need to rewind a little bit. Because um, we're, you and I could talk wellness all day yeah. long. But I want to make sure that people who, who might not know about chiropractic mm -hmm. or who might not understand 
the exact health benefits of that, that we go through that and then talk about the functional medicine and some of the specific services that you're really excited about because there's a whole, um, well, let's start with chiropractic. Okay. So, All right. so with chiropractic, everybody might know or think about like, okay, you're on a table and you get your back cracked. Yeah, right? yeah. Right. <laughs> so well, how would you define it? And um, I know that you're a third generation chiropractor, mm. which is extraordinary, your <clears throat> family. Um, but, but what are really the health benefits and why should, especially filmmakers who might have repetitive use injuries right. Or have very poor posture, carrying cameras, or have heavy yeah. gear. Why should they do it? Yeah, great question. So, like you said, my my dad's dad was a chiropractor. My dad's a chiropractor. He actually, when he went to school, they taught obstetrics. So he actually delivered my brother, my sister, and I at home, and we were born into this beautiful chiropractic world of uh, believing that the body is pretty amazing and has a very special ability to heal itself. And that's simply what chiropractic is all about. I mean, we're, Mm. you know, sure, we deal with a lot of back pain and neck pain and shoulder and, like you said, repetitive stress injuries and postural stuff. And ultimately, we're going to fix that with some very simple adjustments. I mean, the two things that I focus on when I look at somebody's spine is we got to restore movement and we got to restore alignment. And if we can do that, and it's the techniques now are so much more gentle than when my dad went to school. (laughs) When my dad went to school, they actually taught him that when you give somebody a good adjustment, you're gonna see their feet flop around on the table a little bit after the adjustment. (laughs) And believe me, I had some of those adjustments when I was a kid from my dad. I was like, Like, what the heck? (laughs) I was like, wow, that was was wild. (laughs) Um, But this, it's a very simple thing that can absolutely change your life. And that's why I love it so much. And We have so much success with what we do. I mean, you know, in medicine, so many of the techniques, whether it's a surgery or the drugs, might help, you know, 60, 70% of the people, but especially the drugs and the surgeries may have side effects that, you know, create more problems down the road. And what we do, honestly, probably helps like over 90% of the people that we treat. It's hands-on, we get to, you know, touch somebody, feel their spine, uh, see where the muscular imbalances are. And then through some simple, gentle adjustments, just restore that alignment, restore that movement. Uh, try to talk to them about, obviously, postural changes mm-hmm. that they might be able to make or simple exercises they might be able to do or some lifestyle changes that are going to help them get back on track. Um, you know, we, I can take coaching as a you know, a water polo coach and put it into my practice as a uh, health coach too. I mean, yes. we get to deal with people every day and, you know, what can I do to help myself? Mm-hmm. And as long as they do it, <laughs> you know, they're going to be better off. But um, it, it's not a magic bullet. You know, people need to take some responsibility for their health and they need to do some simple practices, whether it's developing that morning routine and getting out in the light a little bit more and, you know, eating the right things, staying away from the simple carbs and the sugars, you know, but, um, they do some simple things, we can get their lives back on track. And we see life changing things in the practice every day. So it's easy to have that gratitude and that that um, fulfillment, mm-hmm. you know, every day from what we do, because we touch people's lives and we, we change them with what we do. Well, it's huge. And I have to say, um, you know, I've been going to you since Dr. Todd Hewitt in Pasadena recommended, you know, almost 20 years. And I think for me, chiropractic is the one consistent proactive um, health routine thing that I have done. Um, and, and I tend to put myself lower on the list than I should. Mm -hmm. And, but, but it, the difference that I feel is so extreme because I hold all my tension, as you know, in my neck and my shoulders and upper back. And I think that it's an instant relief Mm -hmm. and that it makes such a profound difference. And I, I can now feel it after doing, you know, it for so many years that I need, I need to go or I'm going to lock up somewhere yeah. or have something happen. And so I'm, I, I, th- I encourage everybody to, if they're open to it, yeah. because I just know the profound difference. <clears throat> and I know that so many of your patients 
I just, I, I'm a people person and I yeah. observe when I'm there and you can really see like people coming in in pain or their back is out or I had, I've had a lot of back crises where I haven't been able to move yeah. because I twisted yeah. wrong or lifted wrong or did something. And I swore the last time I went in with Dr. Aaron, I was like, I am never going to move. I'm not going to be able to stand up straight. Yeah. And after a couple of times, it was just extraordinary. Yeah. So I I can, you know, I, I'm the greatest fan because I yeah. know from experience and I think that chiropractic is is underestimated yeah. and a lot of people just go to Western medicine. And so let's talk about like some of the neat, do you have, what's your most extreme story? Uh, like, you know, almost I think of like a, a you know, somebody that could not move and then yeah. went to you all. I mean, what are some success stories that you could share? Yeah. And before I say that, I want to say that, um, you know, a lot of people are kind of afraid of chiropractic. Yes. And, and most people, most new people that come in have some kind of chiropractic story. You know, and they finally got to a point where I got to do something else. Nothing else is working. Yeah. Um, but it really is so much more gentle than it used to be. And, um, you know, there's some doctors that will put people on these long-term care plans where you got to go like, you know, five days a week and then three days a week and two days a week. We're, we're a little different. You know, we try to work with schedules and work with people and, and try to make it so it's more doable. And some people do need a little bit more care to get them out of crisis and get them into a better spot. But for the most part, once you're in pretty good shape, most people can get in once a month or once every two or three weeks and do really well. And the people that do the best are the people that get some regular care because you're you're basically giving your body a little bit of a tune-up every so often. Um, and it's pretty simple and it's pretty magical. Okay, so this is cool. So it really helps your immune system and I, let's get into some of this because filmmakers can't yeah. get sick. Right. The, the one thing is they can never call in sick. They can never, um, Shane has never had a sick day. Yeah. And the reason he can't is because so many people, his position is so critical. Yeah. and but that it depends on him. Everybody depends on him. Yeah. Very much like you can't get sick no. when you're an Olympic coach yeah. or an Olympic player. And if you do, or you have- Or a chiropractor. Or a chiropractor. Sick, people are in trouble. <laughs> People are in trouble <clears throat> yeah. um, because you have to go to work sick. Yeah. Uh, like it, it's, you know, canceling days and days of patients. Yeah. So I guess how does chiropractic beef up the immune system in the body so that it actually prevents illness? Yeah. And it helps because this is fascinating stuff to me. Yeah. No, <laughs> it's it's really a great question. And like I said, we're we're balancing out the spine. We're keeping movement and alignment what that does, you know, we don't talk a lot to most patients about it because they just want to get out of pain. They just want to feel better and go forward. But it has so many benefits beyond that because when the spine's in alignment and working properly and each vertebra is moving like it should, then the nervous system is more healthy. And the nervous system, because the nervous system is housed within the spine, mm -hmm. it's the spinal cord. And from the spinal cord is how the brain communicates with every single part of the body, whether it's an organ, a tissue, a muscle. So when your nervous system is healthy, your nervous system controls everything in the body. Mm -hmm. So your nervous system controls the immune system. And hence, if your nervous system is more healthy, your immune system is going to be more healthy. There's tons and tons of studies with chiropractic and the immune system, with chiropractic and digestion, with chiropractic and sleep, you know, <laughs> with chiropractic and, uh -huh. you know, kidney problems. I mean, all kinds of stuff. It's, it, and those are like secondary effects that most people don't talk about. But, you know, when we get patients to come in and say, I don't know what's going on, but I'm sleeping so much better, you know, or I, I, mm -hmm. I don't have that stomach issue I had before because their nervous system is healthier and that's controlling everything in the body. Okay. So this is the second brain, our gut. Yeah. And so it's, and the nerves, and I'm just vagus nerve obsessed. So the vagus nerve goes all the way down just to get into a little science here. Yeah. And, and I think people don't understand about innervation and how, and why this is important. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about that. We have a bunch of cranial nerves that, yeah. that go all the way down the spine and how that can potentially 
impact health is so significant. And yeah. unless you're in the medical field and have really studied this, um, I feel that this is important for everybody to know. Okay. And and if your vagus nerve very specifically is overactive or underactive, all of a sudden you're fainting, you're having all sorts yeah. of major health problems. So uh, this innervation yeah. and nervous system is it's critical for people to understand because Absolutely a lot of critical. times I think that they they don't all these health things crop up. Yeah. And you're in health crisis where your body kind of can give you little signals along the way, but you're ignoring those, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. for sure. I mean, the, there's uh, 12 cranial nerves mm -hmm. and probably the most important single nerve in the body is the vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that? Well, the, <clears throat> there's something called the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is all the things that go on without you having to think about it. So... You know, the central nervous system, what controls your muscle activity and, you know, all, all these other things. But the autonomic nervous system is broken into two parts. It's broken into sympathetic, which is fight or flight, and parasympathetic, which is rest, heal, and digest. 90% of the parasympathetic system is in the vagus nerve. So if the vagus nerve is messed up, if it's not working right... You, we have a saying that you can't be in crisis and heal at the same time. And if you're stuck in fight or flight, if you're stuck in that sympathetic world, which most people are in today's world, mm -hmm. it's really difficult for the body to heal. So to have a healthy uh, vagus nerve um, action and reaction is really, really critical. And there's, there's definitely ways to upregulate your vagus nerve, um, mm. but keeping your upper cervical area in alignment is one of the most important ways to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, things like deep breathing, even just working on box breathing or four, seven, eight breathing can help to reset your vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. um, but most of us in today's world, unfortunately, because we watch too much news and, <laughs> and we're bombarded by the craziness <laughs> yeah. of the world, are we get overrun by the sympathetic system. And sympathetic, like I said, is fight or flight. So mm -hmm. um, the vagus nerve is huge and it controls a lot of digestion. Um, and, if, and so if you're having irritable bowel or you're having Crohn's disease or any of these things, most likely the vagus nerve is involved in some way. Most likely. Or not involved, and it should be. <laughs> and it should be. <laughs> yeah. So it's either under or overactive. Yeah. 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 See, this is amazing. Yeah. And again, I believe that that knowledge is power yeah. for people. And, and people want to understand more about their bodies. I think when I grew up, you know, people kind of just went to the doctor if you were doing the Western medical route. And, yeah. you know, your doctor was more godlike where you weren't meant to question. Right. You were just, and that's one of the things that I very much like about the way the world has shifted and changed mm -hmm. is yep. that now people are really a partner in their own yep. health. And they and need that, to be. And they need to be. Yep. They need to be for consistency and for, for you know, just questioning things when they don't make sense yeah. yeah yeah and i do think that one of the things that came from what we went through over the last two or three years mm -hmm. is that a lot of people are starting to question more what what can i do more myself to keep mm -hmm. myself healthy and not have to rely on just what's the next vaccine or what's the next medication i need to take yeah um <clears throat> which i think is a really good thing that, as a result of COVID. <laughs> as a result of COVID that people are starting to say, I got to take better care of myself. And, you know, it, honestly, it was the people that were in poor health already that got in the most trouble. Yes. And um, and I think a lot of people do realize that, that if we keep ourselves in better health, you know, we're going to perform better. We're going to live longer. We're going to not be sick as much. Yeah. So, so to get back to your chiropractic practice, yeah. um, you and Dr. Lori and Dr. Aaron mm -hmm. have uh, built this extraordinary uh, space. And I think what's really neat, and m hopefully we can eventually, I, I have a dream to like go there and do a shoot there so that yeah. people can see what you have. But it's, you have a lot, so you use your hands, yep. but you also, as a part of this functional medicine and the way that you're challenging yourself, 
Um, let's talk about what you have there and the different machines and kind of how they play into yeah. your diagnosing what's going on for people or, or what's happening. Because yeah. I think that this <clears throat> is very cutting edge and really will be the future. Health and wellness is the future. Yeah. That much I know. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so I guess a little history about our practice. We, we have kind of a family practice. You know, I've treated babies that are one day old. Really? And, um, you know, their moms have been patients for a long time or their dads have been patients for a long time. So they have this tremendous trust. And we have patients that are in their 90s. Um, so, you know, for all of you that are thinking it's too much or too aggressive, mm-hmm. it, it can be really, really gentle. Um, and we, we, like I said, we've been able to help so many people. I mean, we had a 92-year-old guy the other day who just was struggling mm-hmm. to even walk. I mean, he's using a walker and um, he got some care and we got some exercises and he's cruising around without a walker and no back pain. And, you know, just we get to see these things every day. I mean, there's miracles that happen in those, those perfect moments that happen yeah. that are really cool. Um, but about, so we, we cruised along for about 20 years with this family practice and, um, then my dad, who was really my hero, had a stroke, and he was a chiropractor too. And he struggled with going into the medical model, and um, and I struggled because I felt like I really couldn't help him with what we did. I mean, yeah. it felt like it was kind of inept, and you know, we couldn't give him adjustments and get him out of the place he was in. So as we watched him decline and watched him eventually pass away from the, the, um, all the things that happened as a result of the stroke. Um, Lori and I, Dr. Lori and I became very committed to, um, what can we learn? How can we be better, Mm -hmm. um, in helping more people that have more serious chronic illnesses, um, or have things that maybe traditional chiropractic can't take care of as well. Um, so we bounced around a little bit and we, we settled on really two groups. We were in one mastermind longevity group and we have been studying with this other doctor in Las Vegas who does a functional medicine model um, for nine years. And his model wow. is based on something called energetic debt, um, which really is ingrained in that chiropractic philosophy of the body can heal itself if it has what it needs. So if we look at the body as a business, what is the business of the body? Well, the business of the body is to make new healthy cells every single day. And if we don't, if we're energetically low, <clears throat> and by the way, what's really interesting is food only provides about 12% of the energy that our body gets. Our connection with out, outdoors, the mm-hmm. light, sunlight we get, um, our feet on the ground, you know, we're... What is grounding or... Yeah. Grounding uh, is another way we get energy. Um, We get semiconduction from, uh, you know, we get frequencies. There's all these different things, ways we get energy. So the program to kind of fix energetic debt, and and before we fix it, we have to know where people are stuck. So we have a series of tests that people can go through, um, heart rate variability test, a a deep pulse, which is a um, bioresonance test, uh, visual contrast scale, which measures if someone's got biotoxins and they're not going to heal because they've got too big a burden on the body. Mm-hmm. Um, so we can get to these data points of where people are actually stuck. And if we know where they're stuck, now we can kind of laser focus. We can target these areas and rebuild them uh, with different modalities that restore energy in the body. We have something called PEMF, which is pulse or electric- electromagnetic field kind of like walking barefoot on the beach Mm -hmm. um you're you're basically charging the cells and it's something that's so important is that nasa over the last probably 15 years has built this into spacesuits because when astronauts go into space they're disconnected from that earth's energy and they don't get that recharge Mm -hmm. Uh, this actually recharges each and every cell almost like plugging in your cell phone at night so you lay on a mat, it's very simple, and it's a pulse electromagnetic field that's produced um, that's different from the man-made EMFs that we're exposed to. It's a bad thing. This is actually right. a good thing in recharging the cells. 
Uh, we have something called a microcurrent that we can target different organs that are low. So on the deep pulse, we can see is your liver low, is your kidney low, you know, where you might be stuck is heart low. And there's different settings with different frequencies that some really smart people have figured out everything in the body works on different frequencies. Right. And if we can upregulate the good frequencies and kind of take out the bad frequencies, we can make that organ, we can help that organ function better. Uh, all the different ways we can decrease the burden and increase the energy in the body yep. and um, build up the body to be stronger so that we go back to the business of the body. Now it's making these new healthy cells every day. If it's not making them, eventually we're going to produce more and more mutated unhealthy cells. And that's where like autoimmune happens where we produce unhealthy cells. The body starts recognizing, you know, we all have weaknesses in the body, whether it's the thyroid or the joints or wherever where these unhealthy cells go. And people get in trouble because it's called heteroplasmy. The heteroplasmy rates are too high, and that's the, the body producing too many mutated cells because it doesn't have the energy to produce the good healthy cells. That makes so much sense. And you're speaking my language with energy <laughs> yeah. just because, you know, being a Reiki practitioner, I am all about energy. And, that's what we are. And sensing, I mean, we're energetic beings, yeah. Yeah. right? So I think that... Um, it's it's so interesting to look at, and I know that I've read all these studies about like the importance of cold, and you know there and 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 you read it and you hear it and you think, wow, like I'm yeah. supposed to be freezing in my shower so that I can help my mitochondria right. Right. build up energy and be better yeah. and be beefier and yeah. make more, right? But I think that. A lot of this sounds, you know, woo woo yeah. and kind of crazy because we are just so ingrained in the Western medical model. Yeah. As and and the more that you read about this, and in my mind, whatever they're doing for Olympic athletes yeah. or whatever they're doing for NASA, uh, we really need to be paying right. attention right. to because that's where yeah. all the research is, yeah. right? That's where healing has gone, and one of the problems with our modern society is that we are living too comfortable. You yes. know, we're indoors too much, we have heat and we have temperature that's controlled, um, artificial light. Uh, we're, our bodies aren't challenged enough, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's hot or cold or like we have hyperbaric in the office where you, know, you get in a chamber and you're, <clears throat> you're put like the equivalent of being underwater like 10 feet. Mm -hmm. and when you're underwater 10 feet, it's gonna open up your blood vessels more because they're all of a sudden looking for more oxygen. And on top of that, you hook up an oxygen concentrator to that hyperbaric unit, and now you're putting a ton of oxygen in the system. So the body's absorbing three or four times as much oxygen as it would just normally. So by putting the body under pressure in different situations, whether it's hot or cold, like uh, amazing studies out of Finland on saunas, yes. where people that did like four to five saunas per week, um, had just incredible health benefits where all cause mortality was down, Alzheimer's down, cardiovascular disease down, um, you know, better um, max of BO2, you know, all these really positive things from uh, saunas because you make the body produce what it's called heat shock proteins. And the heat shock proteins are, they make the body stronger because right. they create more resilience, basically. You know, okay. and that's, resilience is, what we need to do to live a more youthful, energetic life. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah. And we could go on and on yeah. and on about this all day because right. I, I get equally excited. Yeah. But if I am a filmmaker who's going to be watching this, yeah. um, what is important for them to focus on? Because I know it's sad, but it's true. A lot of this is not covered by insurance. Right. So I guess what are the most cost-effective things that I could be doing, let's say at home, or if I go to my gym yep. and my gym happens to have a sauna, <clears throat> what, what do I as a lay person really need to know to help my health the most yep. um, if I don't have the benefits of some of these therapies? Yeah, it's a great question. One of the probably most important things you can do is to protect your sleep. Mm -hmm. And by protecting your sleep, we have to be in tune with our circadian rhythms. So that's getting back to trying to get outside in the morning and uh, get that morning light before 10 a.m. Let your eyes not look at the sun, but get your eyes in natural light in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, if you can get out again during the middle of the day for 15 or 20 minutes, that's when your body will start making vitamin D. 
during the UV section of the day. And then at night, which I know for some of these filmmakers, <clears throat> probably impossible when you're actually making a film, but to protect yourself against the artificial light. And one of the best biohacks you could probably do is the blue light blocker glasses mm -hmm. uh, after 8 p.m. Because <clears throat> the more that you're exposed to that unnatural light, for example, when you look at your cell phone at night, your brain's going to read that light as 12 o'clock noon. Now and that's totally jacking up your mind because your mind's trying to wind down and get into the sleep cycle. And you need four hours of darkness before your body will actually start producing melatonin, which is probably the most important single hormone in the body as far as the antioxidant for the brain. And melatonin starts working on leptin, which is appetite control. So that exposure to light is one of the simple things you can do. Um, get out in the morning, try to protect yourself at night against artificial light so mm -hmm. that you can sleep and protect your sleep better. Try to get seven or eight hours of sleep. Seven or eight hours of sleep. That's super important. The second thing is probably uh, <clears throat> getting on a regular, like time-restricted eating type pr uh, program where maybe you have 14 to 16 hours during the day or night when you're not eating. Most of the research out there is showing that if people get on, they skip a meal, either skip breakfast or skip dinner and only eat for six or eight hours during the day. It gives your body a little more downtime to build up its energy rather than use its energy to digest um, because it takes a lot of energy to digest food and especially if it's the wrong types of food and you're not getting yeah. the good nutrients so um, that time restricted eating I think is number two that people can do um, and three is probably get on some sort of um, simple supplement program I think supplements can be crazy you know what what really works what doesn't work um, one of the, um, I think, biggest, best supplements that's come out recently that I think is going to show more and more promise over the next 10 years is molecular hydrogen. Um, oh, they're wow. tablets that you um, put in water, it dissolves. Once it dissolves, you drink it. And basically, you're putting hydrogen into your body, and hydrogen acts as electrons, and it's like putting cash in a bank. So going back to the business body, if we're putting cash in the bank, our body has more chance to decrease inflammation or to use that energy how it needs to use it. So I would say looking into the molecular hydrogen as one of your core supplements is really mm -hmm. important. There's so much research on NAD on, uh -huh. um, and the anti-aging effect and how it supports the mitochondria. The mitochondria is what makes ATP energy in your body. Um, there's a really good supplement called Time to Cheeto which it, it's not NAD, you, it's hard to take NAD as a supplement, but it's all the precursors that help build that NAD cycle in your body. Mm -hmm. And they just came out with some really cool research that shows that after uh, 28 days of use, a person actually ages backwards 1.6 years with this um, any, the uh, Time New Cheeto uh, supplement. Can you just dive into that a little bit more? Because for those that might not understand what NAD is yeah. or know the science behind it, because this is fascinating yeah. new um, new research. And where where is this being done? Is this with the, the anti-aging? Yeah, it's more of the anti-aging okay. world. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of, if you look at NAD, NAD is probably one of the most important like anti-aging supplements or things you can do for your body it decreases so much as we age in the body um, but it, it controls what they call these sirtuins which the sirtuins are you, know, you want to geek out on science and <laughs> here we go they, everybody yeah they control like homeostasis in the body they control they help control your circadian rhythm okay. uh, but they're also really all these different hormones are really infected by normal healthy light exposure to light they need to be charged by light so if you don't have the normal get outside light, they don't work as well either. Um, there, there's some really interesting data going on with something called NMN, and NMN is a precursor to NAD. And there's a guy at Harvard named David Sinclair, who's one of the um, you know top guys in the anti-aging world, and he's working on a, a molecule or, or the best ways to take this that can actually increase your NAD in the, in the body. 
Um, but for me right now, this time to Cheeto seems to be the best option to um, build up your NAD. It decreases inflammation. It helps support the sirtuins. It does all these good things that um, for the bang for your buck for one supplement, that probably is one of my favorites. Okay. And where would you get these and how expensive are they? Just so we know. Yeah. The molecular hydrogen is probably, I mean, we carry it all in the office. Um, you can get things online. You have to be careful buying supplements online mm -hmm. because there are a lot of knockoffs and um, you can get stuff that's made in China that, you know, has almost the same labels. It yeah. is not the same. So you do have to be careful where you get it. Um, Time Nichito is a, a, a British company. Um, and I think that you may have to buy that through a doctor's office. Uh, the molecular hydrogen is probably $50 for a month's supply. The Time Nichito is probably 65 or 70 for a month's supply. They're not horribly expensive. Okay. I mean, for what you're getting and what you're putting in your body, it's, it's really important. Because I think that's the biggest thing that I see is that if you're a busy professional yeah. trying to, you know, do your multivitamin and then whatever supplements and yeah. then integrate all of this into your core routine can be very difficult. It's really and, hard. And, you know, I know inflammation is horrible for the body because yeah. it, it really produces all sorts of trouble for the cells. But, and I know that turmeric is like a great simple mm -hmm. thing that you can do to help reduce inflammation. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that, you know, um, especially for filmmakers and people that are so busy, yeah. they really need just, because it's a few simple things to integrate otherwise yeah. it becomes so overwhelming that you're just a you can't afford it yeah. and b you're never going to stick with it because yeah. you know it's it's too much i mean you're traveling and you're yeah. trying to some you know what drives me crazy is like they have probiotics that have to be refrigerated right. well how can you possibly right. when you're on the road when you're on the road yeah. right yeah. <laughs> yeah supplements can be super confusing and you know i have so many patients that'll come in and say you know I have all these supplements, but I, I've forgotten, honestly, what some of them are even for. Right. You know, because I've taken, you know, 40, 50 supplements. And, and some of these, like, biohackers, like Dave Asprey, who I love him, but, you know, he'll take out 50 supplements. And it's like, what the heck? You know, how do you keep track of all that stuff? I know. So I, I would say that um, to individualize a program for somebody, it's probably not a bad idea to get some blood work and at least start there and say... Um, you know, where is my system off and right. what do I need? Do I have high inflammation? You know, do I have high blood sugar or do I have a high A1C? Because A1C is like one of the probably most important markers that we can look at. A1C is the average blood sugar over a three-month period. Mm -hmm. And if that's above 5.4, what we know is that your brain's no longer making new neurons. You're now in neuro degeneration rather than neurogenesis. Wow. So it's, there's some, there's like four or five really, really important markers, mm -hmm. um, inflammatory markers, the A1C, um, you know, things that really are, are major players in being barriers to getting healthy if, you know, if those are low or they're high. Okay. Well, that's super helpful. And obviously everybody has to check with their medical professional yeah. that they're comfortable with. Um, and but I think it's so important to talk about these alternatives. Yeah. And I love what you're doing with this groundbreaking research, you and Dr. Lori, because, you know, as a result of your dad and what a wonderful way to honor his legacy in continuing the health and wellness that he kind of made yeah. so beautifully, it, you, you know, really made your home around that, yeah, right, for, sure. for your siblings. So it's it's such a wonderful way to carry on his legacy. So yeah. congratulations for that. Um, I want to talk about leadership and coaching mm. because I think we've kind of touched on that. We've, we've taken a deep dive into science and yeah. health, but I think that you're an extraordinary leader I know that you're a great listener. I know that listening is one of the most important leadership skills that you wrote about in your book. And by mm. the way, for those of you that want to know, um, Dr. Terry's book, I have it right here, but it's The Swimming Through Life. It's an amazing read. Oh, and um, I learned so much. And I think that you're 
incredibly honest about challenges that you've faced in your life and how you've grown yeah. as both a leader and a coach in this book. And so um, what do you think is important for leadership? Because I, Helena Thomas Dottier is, is an amazing leader and she writes about that we're all our own internal leaders. And I think that leadership is such an important skill. Yeah. Um, whether you're leading a team of one or a team of 100, we all need to become better leaders. So yeah. so what talk to me about leadership and and you know what you've learned and and how you practice it? Yeah. Yeah, so I've you know I've been fortunate as an athlete. I've had a lot of coaches. Mm -hmm. And I think I've taken bits and pieces from all of them. Um, in sport, I think there's two ways that coaches can be successful. One is to coach from a point of fear that you create uh, a lot of fear on your team and everybody is kind of afraid of you and they're, they're going to do whatever you ask, you know, um, up to a point, um, to be successful. Um, I've had a couple coaches like that, you know, in 84. You gotten yelled at. <laughs> gotten yelled at, um, you know, really brutally sometimes um, where you feel like you're this big. Oh. Um, and um, what it did is it brought our team together almost against the coach. Uh -huh. um, I don't like that philosophy. Um, I think the other way to be successful as a coach is to come from a point of love. And I think that to me, love trumps everything. Mm -hmm. If we don't have that in our heart, we're not going to, you know, be good leaders ever. Um, I kind of hate politics right now because I think so many of these politicians have gotten so far away from that that it's terrible that, you know, it's um, creating divisiveness and it's um, not coming from a point of love. And I, I do think that the best leaders are humble and they're um, servant leaders. You know, they're there to help their team be better, um, to help the players be better. Yeah, I was fortunate when I was playing to be um, named captain for 12 out of the 14 years that I played with our Olympic team. And I was named captain by the teammates because um, they knew that I was in it for them more than I was for myself. You know, mm -hmm. I knew that the only way we were going to be successful is to, you know, help each other be better. And it doesn't really, like John Wooden, like my favorite coach says, it doesn't really matter Um you know, who gets the credit, you have to work for each other and be there for each other. So, um, leadership to me is, um, an ongoing learning process that, um, I love. It's a, it's a great science, a great field. Um, you know, I think that <clears throat> each is each of us, the best teams I've been on, honestly, have had more than one leader, you mm -hmm. know, they they shared leadership. And I think that's a great example for family too. Like you said, there's times where you have to take over and you have to be the leader. If you don't, the family is going to fall apart fast. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think coming out of my sports world, I had to learn that lesson in a family atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, but over time, I've, I've learned it that, um, you know, I, we can learn from anybody. We can, um, you know, even the weakest guy in the team sometimes teaches me things at Pepperdine. Um, and... If you're open to learn, I mean, I, I think that's part of being a good leader is um, really, like you said, being a good listener and kind of mm -hmm. not reacting, but um, taking it in and sometimes taking a little bit of time before you before you speak. And how how as a leader do you deal with challenge? Because I think whether it's silly little things coming up at work or really maybe bigger challenges like conflict yeah. um, within a team. And um, Brene Brown talks about the rumble in her leadership book and really, you know, having that difficult confronting conversation, but with always with love mm -hmm. and uh, vulnerability. Right. And so it's making the environment safe to have a really vulnerable but sometimes very uncomfortable yeah. and difficult conversation. And I think knowing the wisdom of leadership and knowing when to do that versus when to ignore silly, petty things that sometimes yeah. cause blow-ups amongst a team or 
even, you know, within your staff yeah. at the office. How do you navigate all of yeah. that uh, with wisdom is my question. Yeah, it's a great question because I think that, you know, when you read some of these leadership books, <clears throat> they talk about embrace the suck, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's part of, part exactly. of uh, what we go through. Um, you know, when I was coaching our um, 2008 team and we were ranked ninth in the world, that whole journey, the last like eight months, felt like we were dodging time bombs. I mean, there was a lot mm. of places where if we went down this road, we, you know, things might have blown up. And we had one player in particular that was really, really tough to deal with. Um, and I think kind of trying to answer that question, it's um, there's a lot of adversity that teaches not only you as a leader, but the team things and, and kind of setting those expectations that it's not going to be a perfect journey to get to where we want to go. There's, there's a lot of bumps and hills that we got to climb. And, you know, sometimes it may seem easy, but a lot of times it's going to be hard. Um, and the other thing I think is really important and that I've learned with a team is that each one of those guys is an individual yes. and being able to read what individual needs. Because again, going back to when I was playing, that coach that was based on fear, he wanted to treat each and every one of us the same and mm -hmm. just, you know, beat the heck out of each player and hope that the cream raised the, rose to the top and the rest of the guys were forgotten about kind of. And I think that some guys, some workers, some employees need a, a kick in the butt sometimes to perform. Mm -hmm. And, but most of us need, you know, a pat on the shoulders and, uh, and some encouragement and, and some direction, you know, and mm -hmm. a lot of times when I see something not working right in the office, I can go back and say, what am I not doing right? You know, 100%. that's making that not work right. <laughs> because <clears throat> usually there's something in leadership that's not working right that is impacting you know, one area of the office and, and that has to fall back on my shoulders. So, so when I talk to somebody, I use a lot of questions, you know, and try to see where they're coming from and what their thought process is on what they're doing and why they're doing it that way and try to understand as much as I can. And, and sometimes it absolutely doesn't make sense. And you know, I can be a little harder on them and say, that's not going to work here. You know, we got to yeah. change that. But a lot of times it's like, I, I get that. And, you know, I'm going to try to do better at my part on this. And, you know, maybe you can do a little better on this part and, and try to work with somebody because it usually comes back to, you can look in the mirror and say, you know, some of it's felt on me. Right. A hundred percent. And I think that listening and curiosity yeah. are the two greatest, like I love curiosity yeah. because curiosity diffuses any situation. Yeah. Right. When when things are blowing up and going yeah. wrong and people are shouting at each other, um, just getting it's the quieter, curious yeah. human that yeah. kind of relaxes the energy. Yeah. And and so I think um, what's really tricky is that when one person on the team and again, I'm thinking of grips and electrics and mm -hmm. people on a on, on a film set. Yeah. There's so many driven, um, hard workers. Yeah. And then usually there's one person that is just not p pulling their weight or yep. a camera team. Yep. And so how do you, with your le leadership style, how would you motivate that human? Or how, how do you um, deal with that on a water polo yeah. team, for example? Because the, th the themes and the threads are the same. And it's, it's usually that one person that can kind of poison with the negativity and just yeah. grumbly or just demotivation <clears throat> yeah. that really ticks off right. the rest of the team. You know what I'm talking about, For right? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We call that a cancer on the team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, for sure, I think go back to those questions, you know, and, and always again, the scoreboard of, you know, what, how would you rate yourself on the job you're doing right now? Or, you know, what do you think you could be doing better? Or, and, and sometimes their answers will make sense. A lot of times it doesn't, and you can get to the real problem pretty fast. But um, fortunately on a, a team sport, mm -hmm. we have the bench. And if someone's not performing, if they're not holding up their part of the bargain, 
you can come here and sit right next to me on the bench for a while. <laughs> and because they obviously want to play, they want to be a part of it. And the bench is a pretty good motivator. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know with, you know, making a film how well something like that's going to work. But yeah, um, you know, a team is a beautiful thing when it all works together and when everybody's kind of pulling their weight and everybody um, cares more about the end result than about, you know, their little piece of the world. And not that their little piece of the world is not important, but um, I think helping them feel important, but also re helping them realize that, look, you know, if if you're doing this and everybody around you sees you doing this, um, it makes everybody else feel bad, but it also makes me look really bad as a leader if I don't do something about this. Right. You know, because it, it's one guy that can kind of ruin that um, healthy leadership too, um, or, or one girl, whatever. Yes, and having that cohesive office, whether it's in the office, whether it's on a film set, you know, there's an objective, there's yeah. a goal. Yeah. And whether it's in business or in sports or, uh, you know, you're trying to finish a feature yeah. or a TV series or yeah. whatever it is. And everybody has to, you know, I think it's what is trickiest for me is really figuring out how to bring out because I really believe that we all have inner God given talents yeah. and, and inner geniuses that, um, we need to be sharing. Yeah. And so it's putting the person in the right position is a big part of it. Yeah. But it's also bringing out that innate skill set. And I think that intuition plays a lot into this. Yeah. And, and I use a lot of intuition, yeah. both in leadership and in Reiki, obviously, because I'm literally channeling yeah. through right. intuition. Right. But I think how does intuition play into your leadership? And how do you use it? I think that it's one of our most underrated skills yeah. that we have within our body, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think that a lot of that comes back to <clears throat> awareness, you know, and, and listening to uh, things people are saying, you know, as you're going through a season. For example, I had an assistant coach early on um, that I worked with, and he pulled me aside at one point. And he said, you know what? He said, you're, you're really hard to work with. And I said, why? He said, because you expect so much of everybody around you. And I said, well, I, I'm sorry, but you know, I expect so much myself Sounds. first. <laughs> and if, if we're going to get better, we have to have a higher level of expectation. Um, but it, it helped me learn maybe to soften that a little bit mm -hmm. and that we still can get where we want to be. Um, so I, I think that intuition has, and it, it, and still is a process of learning to try to read people, you know, and I get that opportunity every single day as a coach and a doctor. Because mm -hmm. when I walk into a room, I can pick up pretty quickly, you know, where somebody's at energetically. Mm -hmm. If they're really negative, if they're um, having a tough day, if, you know, if they're happy, if they're really have intent on healing. Um, you know, sometimes it's interesting, but somebody may treat the staff really poorly and then walk into a room and be like really nice to me. And I know that I get my hands on their neck and I get a chance to yeah. <laughs> do something with them. But um, <laughs> it, it is a, a skill set, I think, that um, I, I still want to try to get better at. But I think I've improved a lot um, because that does help a lot with leadership, too. And I think the other thing that's really important that I've learned about leadership is how I react to something goes a long way. Mm hmm. And if I can maintain my cool and calmness uh, in the heat of a, something crumbling in front of me or rumbling in front of me or a storm that looks like it's going to hit any minute, <laughs> yeah. um, usually the team can come along with me pretty good. Um, you know, and that I feel like I set the tone for that energetically, whether it's like, oh, crap, you know, this is going to be really bad <laughs> or, yeah. you know, we're going to get through this, guys. It's going to be OK. You yeah. know, it's so I think that that kind of ability to stay calm in the heat of a, a real tough moment is really, really important. It is. And I know that you're known for that because you really are a, such a calm, positive force. Um, uh, is that always true for you on the inside too? Or are you at times going, 
Oh man, yeah. it's it's <clears throat> it's hard to fake it, right? Like because sometimes I feel that we we can't overreact in yeah. a situation because you know you can't. Right. And at the same time, I certainly don't have all the yeah. answers. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's it's not being fake, but it's being what's necessary in that moment yeah. to be a good leader. Mm. But but you know, how do you navigate that? Because mm. I think a lot of times today's problems are not easily solved. No. They're kind of unsolvable problems. Yeah. And, and it comes from parenting, it comes from baggage that people haven't let go of, it comes from attachment, I mean, all of these things, yeah. right? So how do you navigate that? It's yeah, tricky. It's tricky, for sure. And there, there definitely are, have been times um, throughout my career as both a chiropractor and a um, coach where something has gotten to me, and mm -hmm. um, I probably haven't reacted as good as I should have, but... Uh, I've also learned from those moments and being able to step back and say that probably wasn't the right response, you know. So I, I think I have a pretty high boiling point when it mm -hmm. comes to what can go wrong before I crack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I do think that's an important skill set for a leader or, you know, character trait or whatever it is mm -hmm. that... Um, we have to be able to handle a little bit more than people that we're coaching or people that we're working with. And yes. um, uh, otherwise, you know, maybe you shouldn't be a leader. Yeah. 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 And I think that that's important because yeah. that's a great point. And just to touch on that, that not everybody is cut out to lead yeah. and that's okay. It's kind of like not everybody wants to own their own business and right. not everybody, some people really want to follow or yeah. be led. And to be um, a follower is so important or to have a less, you know, pivotal role, let's say, yeah. um, because every role matters and every everything is important. Yeah. And so I think it's really knowing yourself and if you want to be a leader or it's just not your thing. Yeah. And I think the other side of that too is to, I don't want to get caught up with my ego as a leader either. hundred percent. Um, so like I have two great assistant coaches, but I look at them as co-coaches, you know, and, and just like I said, when I was playing, um, there was many leaders in the pool and, and sometimes it wasn't me that was going to calm that situation. It was somebody else that had to step up and be a leader mm -hmm. in that moment. And, and I think the more that a leader can, Put good people around them that can handle different things at different times and take some of the burden off because it's hard to be that one person all the time it's impossible maybe it is um, it's it's energetically exhausting and yeah. it's also very lonely and yeah. i think it's delegating is a huge part of great leadership yep. and and you know the people that you're delegating to are your co yeah. co leaders? So right. I I love that philosophy too, yeah. and I I really ascribe to it myself. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> I had a I really interesting conversation once with a um, a CEO of a really really successful company, and and I was head coach of the USA team at the time, and, and he he talked just about that. He said how lonely it was to be a leader, and I kind of like, yeah, but. It doesn't have to be, I don't think, you know, somebody, yeah, somebody ultimately has to be in charge, but, um, we can't do this by ourselves, No, you know, and, and that's why I love coaching is it's taught me so much about teamwork mm -hmm. and what it takes to be successful. And I've been able to apply a lot of that to the office and even to, to healing and to being a better doctor is, mm -hmm. um, it's not all on me. It's you're part of this team. You know, you, if you're going to get better, you got to do some things to take responsibility for your health too. And um, so I, I really love that team aspect. And to me, our best teams are our families. Yes, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, just a couple more questions. What do you think, um, do you have a coach and, and or a mentor? Do you feel that that's important in your success? Because I firmly believe that... Yeah mentoring and and coaching and maybe a combination of both is inherent in if you want to shorten the timeline for yeah. success and 
in becoming a successful human at the very least yeah. and in your career. Yeah. Um, like I said, we've gone on this journey of finding some of the best doctors to train under, and those are some of my mentors in mm -hmm. the chiropractic world, the health world. Um, coaching, we have we have some amazing coaches out of Pepperdine, and you know, there's a fraternity of coaches that I've coached with that um, we kind of communicate and talk to each other and try to mentor each other. Uh, Marv Dumphy at Pepperdine has been a great friend and a great mentor. Um, he's a super successful volleyball coach at Pepperdine. And, um, yeah, we sometimes call it Marvisms when he comes in and <laughs> talks to us. Cause it's like, look, either you're getting better or you're getting worse. You're not staying the same any day. You're not staying the same. You're getting better. Or you're getting worse. You know, he'll say, say things like that. And, yeah. um, for sure we need, um, mentors, we need coaches to help us be better. And I am hundred percent committed to be a better version of myself tomorrow than I am today. Mm-hmm. And no, the only way I'm going to do that is by listening to others who have a little more knowledge or on whatever subject, you know. No, I love that. That's so great. And in closing, what would you like to cover or talk about or share uh, that that you and I have not gone over? Or is there a something that you want to leave everybody with? I feel like you're such an inspirational yeah. human. And um, so what what would you like to to leave people with? Yeah. So, you know, we went on this journey to, um, be able to help people, uh, at a better, deeper level. And, uh, one of the joys, uh, in my life, my younger brother had a stroke about two years ago. And because of so some sad. of the things we brought in the office, um, you know, the energy work and the stem cell stuff. We're been connected with this doctor that does this incredible stem cell stuff that really can have a positive effect on the brain. Uh, and we are working with his brain frequency um, stuff that um, balances and re-energizes the brain. So there's, there's some really cool stuff that we're doing that I'm really excited about. But, you know, I really feel fulfilled that I was able to help my brother through that. And um, he's working, he's doing well, he's not a hundred percent, but he's really doing well. And a lot of it was because we were able to help him because, so it's kind of come full circle. Mm -hmm. I wasn't able to help my dad, but I was able to help my brother. And that made me feel like we're definitely on the right track. Um, wow. <clears throat> so it's powerful. Um, I think if I was to leave something, I would say that it's, it's kind of amazing how powerful our mindset is and how much our mindset really impacts our biology and impacts everything going on in our bodies. So, um, you know, that, that is such a huge area that, you know, starting your day with gratitude um, uh, is so important. Uh, focusing on gratitude, love, and healing is, is really three things that I, I try to focus on every day. And I think that if we can focus on those things and we're going to, we're going to make it a better world. I see that as your bumper sticker, like no. gratitude, love, healing. Yeah. You know, that's so great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Terry Schroeder, for your time, you. your inspiration, your leadership, everything that you've shared with us. We so appreciate you being here in the office and coming on the Inner Circle podcast. And just as a quick end note, people can find Dr. Terry at liveinalignment.org. And all of this exciting new technology and what's happening in the area of chiropractic health and wellness is very prominently featured on your website. Thank so, you. and don't forget the book, Swimming Through Life. Um, it's it's really a fascinating read. And um, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate being here, Lydia. All right. Yeah.